In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Happy Mother's Day. How you guys doing? Doing good? good? You're looking looking good. good. Thank Thank you. you. I I received that. that. Um, Listen, listen, God God is good. good. He's doing some really cool, crazy stuff. stuff. It's It's so awesome awesome to be a part of it. And um, uh, you say, say, why why are we here? What are we doing? Well, I'll answer that question. It's a good question. Seattle Bible Center exists to awaken people to their identity and destiny in Jesus Christ. Paul said it like this. Christ is my message. I I preach to awaken hearts that every person would step step into into the full understanding of truth. truth. That's really our desire today, is that that every person would step into the full understanding of truth. truth. You shall know the the truth, truth, and the truth truth shall set you free. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. truth. No, we, we want truth. We value truth, truth right? Um, um, we're, we're not going to cheapen, cheapen stuff and, and sell out uh, for, for a compromised message. message. Jesus, Jesus is Lord. He is on the throne, and you and I are sons and daughters of the most high God. Boom. Good. Good. Glad, Glad we established, established that. that. Hey, listen, uh, uh, Jesus, Jesus is moving. moving. Every week we are seeing um, healings, healings uh, signs, wonders, signs, wonders miracles. miracles. So, so proud of our prayer ministry, ministry team that, uh, that, doesn't that doesn't just pray for people, but they, they heal the sick and they cast out demons every Sunday morning. morning. So uh, uh, honored uh, to have Touch of Yeshua uh, here on Tuesday nights. Uh, every, every week we're seeing people come to know Jesus, and experience Jesus, encounter Jesus. Yeah. Yay! Yay. And, and um, just, just last, last week, got, got a, a, uh, a text message from a friend of mine, mine uh, goes to church here, and uh, and, uh, and it's, it's a doctor verified miracle of a uh, very very serious diabetes. diabetes. Wayne, Wayne, would you come? Would you come? Bring, bring your doctor, doctor verification. Did you bring it, guys? guys w- welcome, welcome Wayne, Wayne as, as he come. Come on. Come on. Wayne, Wayne, come on down. Guys, Guys, this is a big deal because just a year ago, ago, um, uh, uh, Michael, uh, who leads our our Touch of Yeshua ministry along with his wife, he he also was healed healed of diabetes. So we had two two doctor verified miracles miracles with with diabetes. diabetes. Doctor Doctor verified. verified. Uh, of, of, of complete healing. healing. Uh, we, gotta we gotta get, get some billboards, billboards Sandy. Sandy. Where you can put this, put, put, you know, in the city. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're seeing Jesus too. I just scared the doctor to death day before yesterday. You just scared the doctor to death. Now, yeah. everybody, yes. this is my friend Wayne. Say hi, Wayne. Hi. I'll tell you something about him real quick. Your very first time here um, was on a day when all the other churches in, in town were closed because there was a snowstorm. Yes. And uh, and how did how, and, and you got online to find out if there were any churches that were open? Right. And you had to dig out your own driveway to get out. Two feet of snow. Two feet of snow. How long did it take you to dig your mm, driveway out? Maybe an hour. So you, you, you spent an hour to get out right. of your driveway. Right. Then you got in your car. And how long did it take you to get here? Mm, two and a half, three. So it took you an hour to dig out of the driveway. But I'm, I'm an hour and a half away anyway. So every week, you and your bride. Since then, we, I come here every week. You guys drive four hours every Sunday to, yes. to come to church yes. here at Sarah Bowser. Yes. And, yes. <laughs> and you came on that snow Sunday, and there was only maybe six to eight people here. Right. And you were sitting here, and, uh, and, and I got a word for you, mm-hmm. and I, I didn't know you. Right. And you came up, and we were just doing it for people online. There was only eight people here. Mm-hmm. Everybody else was watching online. And the power of God hit you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I had a diabetic record, 960. I shouldn't even be alive. If anybody knows what diabetics are, there is no such thing. I spent eight days in the hospital. They would not release me uh, without somebody coming and picking me up. And so I was thankful just to even be alive. And a lot of people thought that you were basically dead. Oh, yes. Yeah, like even friends. I, I, and... I, I had a... 
You're the friends I, I, and I family. Wheel, thought, so thought, everybody in the wheel came. Yeah. 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 And they thought that was it. They thought you were done. Oh, they were told that by the doctors. But you're not actually I, I dead. Could, I could never function again. Right. They, even the doctors thought that you were basically uh, dead. They said so. They didn't think. They made a statement that way. And you were hearing things. You were there in the hospital, and you were hearing people talk about you. And oh, stuff. yeah. And they thought you were dead. You guys, it was the night before Thanksgiving. I was feeling weird, so I went to the doctors the day before, and they kind of blew me off and told me just get my blood tested when I left. And about 7 o'clock at night, I get a call saying they'll send an ambulance out or I can drive. And, but I, I couldn't drive. I had somebody close by that drove me. So I spent Thanksgiving 2020 in the hospital, last minute. And you can imagine what a hospital is like on Thanksgiving Day. People don't want to work. So you know what I did? I had my phone. I took pictures of all that stuff. You know, I could still do that. Now, I don't think I could do much else, but yeah, I, I spent eight days there. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Now, the good news is, spoiler alert, Wayne didn't die. No. In fact, he's not even on insulin any longer. <laughs> mm -mm. Nope. Because Jesus <laughs> radically... No, nope. what you got? You got ice cream, whatever you want. Because but... I've seen this guy eat, and yep. he, eats, he eats whatever he wants. Right. When I came up here, I think we got up here, the devil is a liar. Come on, come on. Remember that? Come on. The That's devil right. is a liar. That's right. That's yes. right. Yes, yes. That's right. So then this yeah. last week, you went to the doctor, and what did they tell you? Um, first, you'd have to see their faces. Because every time I go to the doctors, they're all shaking, kind of. So, yeah, this was what it was. My A1C was 13 um, in December yep. of last year, which uh, the, the 13%. 13 diabetes is 6.4. I was over double what anybody with diabetes has. Okay, I even had the doctor put it in writing. She wrote it, without meds, never seen before. With, <laughs> yeah. She My, wrote it down, the doctor wrote it yeah. down, without meds, never seen this before. Yes. I gotta dance, come on! Oh. Oh, 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 come on, oh, oh, yes. let's go! Oh, oh, oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, come on, power, power, come on, right. come on. Right. And this is this is the second this is the second doctor verified diabetes miracle in less than a year. Yeah, she gave me the other one too. The one is ninety two, and one is ninety three. Come on, yeah. come on. From three hundred and fifty, it's not possible. That's what it's just not possible to them. But they. They make so many tests. They test and they test, and then they send you to somebody else so they test you. I told you, that's what it is. Come on, and you're not planning on going anywhere. Of course not. And why do you, why, why, on earth, I know people that wouldn't, you know, they, they can't even drive 15 minutes to get to church, because that's too far to well, go. Why would you drive, you and your bride, why would you guys drive four hours every, why would you make Four hours. She forces that. <laughs> she likes to drive. Why do you guys drive this far to come here? I can tell you that the devil tried to kick me. But you know what? I had the best year I ever had financially last year. Come on. I did. <laughs> come on. I'm not, uh, it's not up to me. I just do what I'm led to do. Get in that dang car two feet of snow. Okay. I'll go. And so, no, he's not told me to leave yet. Yes, so okay. I'm still here. Dude. All right. Okay. And, and the best is yet to come. You're going to oh, go from glory. I, I used to be able to predict. Yeah. You know, kind of make plans of what's I'm going to do and yeah. do this and do that. And then this is going to happen. Now, it's 100% trust. Yeah. I, I, I can't, I can't. Uh, it's amazing every single day. Yes, come what on. Happens. Come really on, is. come on. Yeah, hey, is. I'm proud of you. Love you. Love okay. you, Jamie. Bless you. Thanks so much for sharing that. How many know the test? Come on. You can worship Jesus. It's okay. Come on. Woo! Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. All right. People say, well, you guys, you guys just get excited. You guys are just kind of emotional. But when your friends and your family have basically discounted you and called you dead, and all of a sudden Jesus completely heals you to the degree you don't even have to be on any, any prescription drugs, forgive us if we get a little emotional, okay? All right, if, if you got your Bibles, turn with me. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 20. We've been in a series going through the book of Genesis, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. This is really cool because we get to do a special Mother's Day message, and it gets to be a part of our study of Genesis, which means we don't have to leave the Word in order to do a topical message today because... Um, Believe it or not, the origin of motherhood is right here, right after the, the, the serpent receives its curse, and we see the consequences. Isn't this crazy? Think about this for a second. Last Sunday, we looked at sin and the consequences after man and woman um, ate of the fruit, and then, and then God comes into the garden, right? And then he begins to talk about sin and the consequences. This is crazy. This is, this is a big deal. This is the fall of humanity, okay? And then the consequences of sin. And then what do we have? We have the creation of motherhood. Isn't that interesting to you? Don't you find that kind of... And, and some of you didn't have any idea that there is an origin of motherhood. So for some of you, you're a little bit uh, shocked um, by this. I will tell you this, being a pastor, that Mother's Day is the trickiest holiday to actually preach. It's even trickier than Easter. And Easter is pretty tricky in, in the church. Like whenever we do like an Easter service, I get emails. Brother, don't you know the origin of Easter is a pagan holiday and the rabbits were actually principalities and powers that dominate Seattle from the fifth dimension. And like, <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, Easter's tricky. What, what's trickier than Easter is um, Mother's Day. Why? Because, you know, you've got People that, you know, you got women that um, all they want is, is, is to be married, is to be married and, and, and have children. And the reason why that's all they want is because they've never been married. Right? Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, you know, but all they want is to be married. And if only I could be married, if only I could have children. And then you got people that are married and they haven't been able to have children. And so to come to a service like this where, where only people that can have children get to be honored and celebrated makes it very, very difficult um, to come to church. On, or let's say that you were, were able to have children, um, but you haven't talked to them in, in, in a long time because they're, they're little punks. And they, no, I'm just kidding. And, uh, <laughs> no, but you haven't, you haven't chatted with your kids in, in, a, in a long, long time. And um, you don't even know if, if they're, and they probably aren't going to call you and wish you uh, happy, happy Mother's Day, you know, and then, uh, and then, you know, again, the whole thing of just wanting to, wanting to have children, not able to have, uh, you know, some of you are later, later in age, and you know, so just, just, if you're a, a woman, and you are here in this service, that is just incredibly uh, courageous of you, because this is a difficult Sunday for a lot of women to come to church. So I would like to start by just honoring every woman, every female that had the courage to come to church today. We want to celebrate. We want to honor you. Can we do that this morning? Now, I do have to hit on the fact that we do have a problem, and the problem is that our culture does not honor women. Our culture has a counterfeit honor for women, and that looks like we celebrate anyone who identifies as a woman. There is complete loss and total disregard for the strength, the wisdom, and the spiritual identity of a real woman. And today, we are going to open God's word. 
We are going to contend for the faith because in doing so, we are fighting for a restoration of the sanctity, the dignity, and the holiness that is the priesthood of womanhood and femininity that God has created, that the world has perverted, and the church has dishonored. Honor is a big deal. Why? Because whenever you honor someone, you receive a reward. You say, no, no, that's only for prophets. If you honor a prophet, you'll receive a prophet's reward. No, it's a spiritual law that honor opens a realm by which we can receive in the same way that dishonor will close your heart so that you can't receive anything. This is why it's written in God's word to honor your mother and father. You say, yeah, but you didn't know my father and mother. Or you might even say, I didn't even know my own father and mother. How can I honor someone that I didn't know? Now listen, the Bible doesn't say to trust your mother and your father. It doesn't say to respect your mother and your father. Why? Because we respect people based off of their performance. So I will, per, I will respect you in your industry if you have done something worthy of respect. But if you are in your industry and you are treating it like a game and you are not taking your position seriously, how can I respect you in your place of industry if you are not using your creativity and wisdom to carve out a kingdom realm? I'm sorry, I can't respect you, yet I am commanded biblically to honor you. Why? Because Honor is not based off of performance. Honor is based off the fact that as a human being, you've been created in, Im in, you've been created in the image and the likeness of a living and holy God. Every human being is an image bearer, and that means that every human being has been created in the image and likeness with the intentionality of the Father, and they represent not only the decisions that they have made, but they represent a lineage and a bloodline, and I believe that even as we honor people, we receive not just from their wisdom, but we can honor from a place of supernatural inheritance that goes behind them and before them because you represent more than yourself. You represent a legacy line. You represent um, uh, uh, a, a, a royal and holy plan that began with Adam and goes beyond you. That legacy and anointing, they travel through bloodlines so when you honor Pastor Darren, you don't just receive of the culmination of wisdom and data accumulated through 40 tremendous years on this planet. No, when you honor me based off of the fact that I am, a represent, <laughs> I am representing King Jesus on the earth, and even though you don't agree with everything that I say, you agree with most of everything, it's mostly amazing, but maybe not everything, that you can honor me for who I am in Christ without tripping out over who I'm not. <laughs> and when you do, you drink of a vintage that's far older than 1982. When you do, you are drinking of a vintage that goes through Daryl, through Robert, through my great-grandfather, who I didn't know very well, but I hear he wasn't a very good guy. My great-grandfather, I hear, was quite a womanizer, quite a pub crawler, okay? Uh, the Stots, we were originally Vikings. That means, brother, that means that our family most likely robbed your family's sheep. Okay, and here's what I know. Even through the good, even through the bad, and even through the ugly, there is a redemptive 
anointing and calling, that there is a redemptive virtue that travels through my bloodline, which means that I have a generational inheritance that can be unlocked through honor that I can receive of, and so can you. This is why there's such a battle to dishonor women within the culture and within the church. Why? Because there is an anointing, there is a grace, there is a virtue that are carried by women that is needed in the church, that is needed in the family, that is needed in our country. And as long as we continue to reduce and weaken and treat women as objects or to treat women as slaves or our servants, or there's even worse words that even some communities find acceptable, that when we degrade and dishonor women, we are damming up the portal of virtue in our homes and in our country and in our churches because there is a grace and a wisdom and a creativity that can only be released through women. It's a real problem when you have a culture where anybody can identify as a woman at any time. There's this thing, it's called gender fluidity. fluidity. And the way that it works is that you can actually rotate and step in and out of genders at will any time of the day. In fact, some young people will say that they will switch their gender up to 16 times a day. I identify as a man. I identify as a woman. I identify as a man. Now I'm a woman. Which is why all the track records are being broken by men who identify as women. Which is why the swimming records are being broken by men who are putting on women's swimsuits. Which is why we are seeing a fight for the origin plan of God because if we allow this kind of nonsense to continue through the passivity and limp wristedness of the church, we will advocate the call of God as a nation, as a country, and as a church. And when we say, I just don't want to offend anybody, I just don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, what we are doing is we are dishonoring the grace that is on women, and we are closing up a portal of virtue through our fear of man, which is pride, which comes before a fall. And I can tell you and point to you, and I won't throw out names, but many pastors who are cowards and our country is going the wrong direction, not because of politicians, but because of cowardly preachers who will not preach the Bible who will not preach the Bible, who will not take a stand. Well, I just think, I don't care what you think. What Pastor Darren thinks. I don't care what Pastor Darren thinks. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Well, I feel, okay, that's great that you feel that way, but you felt different 10 minutes ago. If I was to go along with your feelings, I would be on an emotional bipolar roller coaster. I'm sorry, I don't even trust my own feelings, yo. If I trusted my own feelings, I wouldn't pray for your healing. Why? I just don't feel like it. Listen. <laughs> the craziest things I've ever seen Jesus do through me took place when I did not feel like it. One of the craziest revival miracle meetings I've ever been in, I was sicker than a dog and I didn't even want to be there. God showed up, did all kinds of crazy miracles. I didn't feel like it. Don't trust your feelings. Trust the spirit of Christ Jesus. Trust the unchanging word of God. <laughs> and sometimes, <laughs> trust the science. <laughs> All right. Genesis 3.20. You there? I gave you extra time because I realized that some of you don't go to church. And so uh, it is Mother's Day. I, I crack jokes. Mother's Day is like our largest attendance of the year. And that's because moms say, would you come, to, they say to their family, moms say to their family, all I want for Mother's Day is a green tea, um, matcha, a latte with eight scoops of matcha, um, soy, no water, no foam, extra hot. 
and for my whole family to come to church with me. I just want my, come on, family. Every, everybody, everybody in the car. We're going to church. Okay. Father's Day is the smallest attendance in the church. <laughs> I don't even have to tell you why. You know, what do you want for Father's Day, Dad? For you guys just to all just get out of the house and leave me with my TV and surround sound and my Odules. Okay, good. All right, here we go. Um, Genesis 3, verse 20. Here we go. Um, now, remember, previously in the garden, we had the serpent, God, man, woman, sin and fall, rivalry and dissension. God comes into the garden and is looking for Adam. When he finds Adam, Adam says to God, whoa, 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 hold up. Why are you looking for me? That woman that you gave me made me do it. Whoa, whoa, you looking for me? She did it first and you gave her to me. So the way I see it, this is her problem and your problem. That's the way I see it. And God says, I don't see it that way. I'm looking for you, son, because you are the man. So there's, there's Adam, right off the bat, throws his wife under the bus. There's immediate division. God hands out the consequences. Now it's time for Adam to respond. This is what Adam does. He turns to his wife. He doesn't turn away from his wife. He turns to his wife and he releases identity over her. He, he, he just dishonored his wife. But I see this as a form of repentance. And, 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 and Genesis 3.20, instead of, again, turning away from, he turns to, and it says, and the man called his wife Eve. What did he do? He named her. Okay? Now, this is a big deal. Why? You would think with this confrontation, with this rivalry, with the very first fight in a marriage, it's a pretty big deal too, right? Like the two of you just shattered the order of the cosmos for the next couple thousand years. Thanks a lot. And this is what Adam does. He doesn't do the, I just need to be alone. I just, need me, I just need some me time. He does it, slam the door in his wife's face, and go for a drive. <sighs> Where are you going, Adam? It's none of your business, woman. Get back here. We need to talk about this. I ain't talking about you. Where are you going? I'm going for a drive. <clears throat> Any drivers here? <laughs> you better not be going to Taco Bell. You've lost 30 pounds, Adam. Don't go back to that way of living. <gasps> Woman, I'll go wherever I want to go. <clears throat> no, what does he do? In this place, I know, it just got real, didn't it? In this place of like this great, <laughs> of, he had to call her woman because she doesn't have a name yet. So all the time, it was woman, that woman. What does Adam do? In this place of this, this, Something's changed in him. What, what's changed? Well, when God spoke to Eve and said, this is, this, is, this is the consequences of your sin, he also prophesied. He revealed, he disclosed the future. And he said, even though everything has been damaged and fractured by sin and fallenness and the consequences of your decisions, God says, it is through the woman that I will send my Redeemer to come and undo this mess that my Redeemer and the Restorer of the world is going to come through the seed of the woman. On one hand, bad news, we screwed up. On the other hand, good news, God's going to fix this. 
And who is he going to fix it through? The woman. Adam is smart enough to pick up on that revelation where the church has been dumb enough to miss that revelation for thousands of years. Adam was smart enough to say, whoa, 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 whoa. That through my bride is going to come Emmanuel, God with us. That God is not done with humanity, but he's going to write himself into the storyline of humanity. And Adam gets a revelation, and he says, your name shall be Eve. Why? Because, e because she was the mother of all living things. The problem with this is that she hadn't even had Cain yet. Do you see what's taking place? In this place, Adam looks at the woman, and what does he see? He sees the call of God on her. He sees the grace on her. He sees the virtue on her, and he sees that she is Eve, which means life, or giver of life. That through this one who the enemy manipulated to bring about death, God was going to redeem and use as the agency by which there would be life, multiplication, and fruitfulness on the earth. Eve was called the mother of all living things because the identity of every woman is to be the mother of life, is to be a life giver. And this has nothing to do with the birth of Cain, and this has nothing to do with you having biological children. That you, who are a true woman, not just identify, right? That if you are a woman, there is a supernatural grace, a supernatural virtue, and the science says you are different. You are different, and your difference is important. That for the Christian, we are complementarians. That's a big word. Say that with me, complementarians. What's a complementarian? A complementarian believes there are men there are women, and they are different. And praise the Lord. A complementarian believes that there are men, and there are women, that men have a grace, an anointing, and a call, that women have a grace, an anointing, and a call, and they are different, and they are supernaturally compatible. Not only are they compatible, but when they partner together in union, they reveal and represent the character and nature of God. That God, who is a spirit without gender, creates, recreates himself through male and female. Yes, and that there is a difference. Men and women are different. However, one is not better than the other. You say, yeah, but the Bible says that men are to rule over their wives. No, that was the last church. You weren't here last Sunday because we studied that passage. That is not part of the law. A lot of churches teach that that is part of the law. It's part of the Ten Commandments. The first commandment is men rule over your wives. No, that is the consequence of sin that there would be rivalry, division, dissension, and in this place, the man would rule over his wife. That's not a commandment. And that is not a virtue in the church. What's the blueprint? Thanks for asking. You guys are asking such great questions. The blueprint is seen when God comes to man and woman and gives them their commission, their call. And what do they do? To be fruitful and multiply to subdue the earth and take dominion. And God knew it was not good for man to be alone, so he creates a helper, a helpmate, a companion. That sounds familiar. Yeah, because he also does that in the New Testament. Jesus lives, dies, and resurrects. Jesus says to his church, it's not good for you to be alone. You're not gonna be able to go into all the world and make disciples of nations in and of yourself. Neither was Adam able to take dominion of the whole world. 
church, you're going to need a helper. And this is what Jesus says to the church. I will send to you a helpmate. I will send to you a companion. I will send to you God the Holy Spirit. Any man that positions himself to rule over his wife because he believes he is better, more valuable, and that she is somehow some subservient spiritual slave of his. Any man that believes that has already hit his cap and will never come into the fullness of what God has for him. Why? Because he has dishonored and disqualified himself through a misappropriation of the word of God. And he has believed the lie that his wife is his primarily instead of believing the truth that he is stewarding a daughter of the most high God and that they are to rule together for the purpose of human flourishing and the restoration of the earth. Here's the problem with religion. Religion partners with the spirit of the Antichrist. It's like they're married. And they come to keep you and the church small and to keep the church barren so that we cannot reproduce. The spirit of religion will come to rob the church of all true intimacy with God himself and with each other. And without intimacy, there's no procreation. Which is why you go to all these churches throughout the world and they're empty. You go to all these churches throughout the United States and they're empty. Why? Because they are operating according to a man-made plan. Always looking for another man-made plan. And with all of this human planning, they have neutered the church from its ability to procreate, which only comes through covenant and intimacy. It only comes through companionship, partnership, and honor. And for this reason, it is imperative that we value and we honor the greatest of all commandments, that we love the Lord our God with everything that is within us. We fear him and not man. And then we love our neighbor as we love our spouse. And as Paul would say, you love your spouse as you love your own body. Yeah, men and women are different. Not, one's not better, but they're different. By the way, we're biologically different. My son just turned 11. <sighs> that means daddy's got a job to do. That means daddy just became a biology teacher. Why? Because every daddy is to be a biology teacher. Your children should be learning about sex and sexuality from their parents and not from the schools and not from the locker rooms. I told my son, I said, I know more than any of your fool friends. I told him, if there's anything you ever want to know ever you ask me, I will tell you. But your friends, they will always think they're smart, but the majority of them are idiots. I said, if there's anything you want to know, you never be ashamed. You ask me anything. This is the role of a daddy. We teach the differences. So I was trying to explain to my son <sighs> that humans are like puzzle pieces. This always works better with a whiteboard or with, with a sketch. Pad. And I'm not trying to be crude, but this is, this is how God made us. So the puzzle piece, you know how puzzle pieces have these round parts and then they got other parts where they go in, right? So a man has his head He's got his shoulders, he's got his leg, he's got another leg, he's got another leg. <laughs> a woman has a head, she's got her shoulders, she's got a leg, she doesn't have that other leg. In fact, it comes up like a puzzle piece. And coincidentally, it's the same size as the dude's leg. And then she has another leg. What does this mean? These two puzzle pieces fit together 
perfectly. This is what's called the ontological argument for the existence of God. What it means is this. That the perfect compatibility between a man and a woman is proof that there is a supreme creator. Because this could not just happen through evolutionary chance. It is this that it is time for the church to model. This that it's time for our homes to model. It is this that it's time for our businesses to model. Because there is a grace that is needed within the church that has looked like this. A male-dominated hand that uses that hand to slap around women. And it is also this within the culture. A female-dominated hand that has been used to reduce and weaken men and their identity. God hasn't called for women to be lions. Hear me, roar. And God has not called for men to be slave drivers. Woman! God has called for us to be compatible in harmony and in union. In doing so, this is proof that there is a supreme creator. It's the perfectness of his creation. What's at stake? Our nation has forgotten the origin of motherhood and postmodernism. What's true for you can be true for you. What's true for me is true for me. You can be a man. You can be a woman. I identify as a giraffe. <laughs> that doesn't make me a giraffe. The truth isn't what makes people feel great, but it's truth by where we can see a restoration of true honor and dignity. We don't compromise the truth to make people feel good. Without truth, there's no repentance, there's no salvation, and there's no restoration to people's homes, people's marriages, and our country. God's blueprint for the woman is to be the life giver, is to be the nurturer, is to be the source of creativity and wisdom, and this is not contingent on her ability to have children, nor is it contingent on the success of her children. If you are a woman, you are an Eve, you are a life giver, you are a source of life, you are a restorer, you are a source and portal of virtue, wisdom, and beauty. Do not dishonor yourself. Do not tolerate others dishonoring you. You, you are beautiful, you're gorgeous, you're worth fighting for, and any fool who says otherwise, send them to Pastor D. We must restore the dignity and the honor that women deserve because in doing so, we will, we will open up a gateway in the spirit where restoration can occur. This place, believe it or not, hasn't always been such a thriving, hip, supernatural locale. This place once hosted a crazy, wild move of God, and then it hit the fan. Just... <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> the only thing that was left was 20 people over there in the old chapel, wondering if this was the end. Meanwhile, this gal that was saved under my grandpa's ministry, this wild hippie that went to the altar, gave her life to Jesus, got radically jacked up in the spirit, was doing revival in Australia. And God spoke to her, a woman, <laughs> and said, I'm not done with that church yet. I'm calling you back to restore that church. She came back here. They had changed the name to New Beginnings because that's always what you call a church when it's been through something traumatic. <laughs> if you ever go to a church called New Beginnings, know this. There was some... <laughs> <laughs> Young pastor, the first thing you do is name change. Oh, there's got to be something. I got it. New Beginnings. Okay. When they, 
one of our elders, John Shada, when he took the sign down for Seattle Revival Center and threw it in the dumpster, the Lord spoke to him and said, this dumpster is a tomb. You're throwing away Seattle Revival Center, but I'm going to resurrect it. <laughs> Gail came back. She said, I don't care if there's five people here. We're not meeting in that little chapel. We're meeting in the Revival Center. They went through this place. They anointed all the walls downstairs with oil. They went out to the four corners of the property, pounded stakes into the ground with scripture verses on the stakes. They began calling people up and repenting for the damage that had been done. One of the people that they called up was me. Now, when she told that story about that worshiper that was being a punk, that God had the dragon by his hair, that, she was talking about me. She called me up. Now, I told my mom, I said, I am not going back to that church. I know that Gail wants me to be the worship leader. I am not doing it. I'm not going back there. But I'll meet with her because I've always respected Gail. She's always been like a mom. So I came in and I met with her. And her and Pastor Greg started repenting to me for all this stuff. And they had done nothing wrong. And I said, Pastor Gail, I don't understand why you're, why you're repenting to me. You guys haven't done anything wrong. She said, somebody needs to. Somebody needs to stand in the gap. That somebody is me. Will you forgive me? And out of respect, I didn't mean it. I just said it. And that's the problem with words. How many of you have ever said something that you didn't mean, but it put you in a place you didn't mean to be? That's what happened to me. I don't mean to be here right now. But I said, I forgive you. It was like a setup. <laughs> I've tried this since then, right? When people are in a bad place, I just repent to them. You know, religion says you gotta force, you gotta punish people so they repent. The gospel says people that need repentance, go and repent to them. Go and take responsibility for the crap that's happened to them. So I said, I forgive you. I didn't even realize it. That forgiveness opened up my heart. I was on a hunting trip, and I had a dream. And in the dream, I was back here, and I was leading worship. I was singing a song that I'd never sung before. When I woke up from the dream, I was still singing that song. When I stopped singing it, it was gone. And it was so cool. I felt so alive. I thought... I kind of want to go back to that church. <laughs> Years later, the Lord wrecked me. And I had coffee with Pastor Gail. And I was going to tell her something that she didn't know. God had called me to be a pastor. The only problem was she already knew. <laughs> the elders already knew. Everybody already knew. I was the last person to know. God used a mom to nurture this place back into health. God used a mom to do what only a mom could do. And if our elders had been religious and hard-hearted, there wouldn't even be a church here. This would be condos. There's things that God wants to do that only a woman of God can do. And this is made possible through men who are humble enough to honor our wives. To honor not just our wives, but to honor our daughters. To honor any sort of, I, I said this to my son Peter, I said, there will be a lot of boys that you know throughout your life. And they will see women as something that they need to go and get. Almost like the prey. I'm going to get myself a woman. I'll put, I'll put on my woman spray. I'm going to go on the hunt. I'm going to get a woman. This is what I told him. You're a stot, and stots don't think that way. We do not prey on women. We rescue women. We fight for women. We are not on the prowl for a woman. And I said to Peter, it is our job to protect mom to protect Abigail, to protect Sophia, to protect Victoria. We got a lot of ladies in our family we have to protect. 
But we don't just protect our own. We protect others as well. Because a lot of boys have not been taught to honor women, to honor life givers, to honor this call of motherhood. Is that good? Media team, let's go to a commercial. Uh, put on my book commercial so I can sell some books. I'm going to blow my nose. <laughs> Two, one. We're back. Hey, guys, awesome. Here we go. Faith without works is dead. What does that mean? Every Sunday, every service, as our minds are being renewed, we need to be accountable for what we're going to do with this revelation. My hope and my heart is that Holy Spirit would be here to turn this knowledge into action. Because I believe that if you call Seattle Revival Center your home church, there is something that every single one of us can do to change the culture and to create this new culture, to take this blueprint, to take this origin of humanity and to unroll it and to begin to massage it into our business, into our home, into our schools. How will we restore the the dignity and the honor, the beauty and the virtue of womanhood and motherhood. How could your business be different if you honored women and they were allowed to nurture the business in a healthy way? What would it look like if the church would honor women and we could see the restorative grace of God come to restore all the years of things that men have so badly damaged? <laughs> What would it look like if we as the church could do something in Seattle to say you don't need to hide your femininity behind the strength of masculine energy? Why? Because God has created a beauty that deserves to be nurtured and protected. You don't need to act like a man, hide behind that man thing. And in the same way, young man, you do not need to hide who you really are behind a feminine dis. Uh, uh, demeanor, there is restoration, there is hope, there is transformation, and it's not through white knuckling your way into holiness. It's the work of grace through faith alone in Christ Jesus so that no man can boast in their superiority or even in their gender. Let's not become gender racist. Well, I'm straight. Ha, ha, ha. Straightness is not the core of my identity. I am a son, and his work is at work in me. His finished work is transforming me. And if it wasn't for the grace of God, I'd be not a good guy. So just say, I got to get to work. I got to get to work. Just say it out loud. I got to get to work. We got a job to do. What's our job? Church. We are going to restore honor to femininity. We are going to restore honor to motherhood. We're going to restore honor. We've got to model something. and We've made mistakes, and we'll make mistakes, but there's grace. And we're going to see healthy families. We're going to see healthy marriages. We're going to see healthy co-ed leadership. We're going to see co-ed anointed preaching. We're going to see God use healthy, masculine men. Take their place, and we're going to see beautiful, anointed, grace-filled women who bring about the restoration of the fear of the Lord. Any man that doesn't know the fear of God is because he's not married. <laughs> Here's some directives. Write them down. Number one, declare it out loud. At SRC, we honor. Everyone say Honor. All, All women. women. Why? Because Christ did. Do you remember the woman that was caught in adultery? She wasn't worthy of honor. Everybody was, was getting ready to kill her. And what did Jesus say? Jesus said, she is worth honoring. Religion says, kill her. The gospel says, she is worth saving. Amen. Religion was dishonoring her, and Christ honored the unhonorable. 
at SRC, we honor all women. Number two, declare with me, we fight for women and for the sanctity of life. If Eve was called life and the life giver, then what does it mean when we can legally destroy a life that is in a womb? It's been disguised and masqueraded underneath choice. This has nothing to do with choice. This has everything with dishonoring the sanctity of the life giver. We have people that are called counselors that give counseling to 13, 14, 15 year old girls, telling them there will not be long term psychological consequences to, to aborting a life inside their womb. If you are a female, you have a call to be a life giver. That is in your subconscious. That is in your DNA. Your DNA says, I was created to create. That's what your DNA is saying. When that creation process begins, and then all of a sudden, a doctor ends that creative process um, uh, 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 by removing and, and, and murdering that creative process that is happening within the, within the womb. That is one of the greatest, most dishonoring, most disgraceful acts that could ever happen to a young woman. You said, well, she made a choice. Yeah, did she? Did she make a choice? Or did you, who were trained in psychological manipulation, bring that girl to a decision that she should have never had to make in and of herself? Did you really help her? Or did you add to your numbers, your charts? When I see the abortion statistics and I see what's going on, it is, it, is, it, is, it is so sad. And I love to see what is happening right now within our country. Why? Because things are shifting and things are changing. But things are only getting started for the church. We have to do more. Darren has to do more. Seattle Revival Center has to do more. We've got to be a beacon of hope. Because even if they didn't le uh, illegalize abortion, even if this thing stayed legal, the church should be so on her game that nobody is getting abortions. Why? Because we got the money you need, the resources you need, the family you need, the fathers you need, the mothers you need, the grace you need. It's, it's an epidemic not because it's legal. It's an epidemic because the church has sucked in our nation. It has been lame. It has been handicapped. And we think, the church thinks, that all change should be legislated and that'll fix everything. You've been deceived. The government is, is, has, has, has made so many things. Like, that's what we need, more laws. You think that's going to fix it. More laws. That's what we need. More laws. No, no. Maybe what we need is a church that's vibrant and alive. And maybe what we need are less laws. Maybe what we need are less laws. Government all up in everything. All up in everything. And the church is like, we need more laws. No, we need a stinking church. We need a people. We need a bride. We need resources. We need homes. We need godly counselors, godly teachers. And we need fathers that will be teachers in their home. We need mothers that will be teachers in their home. Where we won't allow our own past to shame us into being cowards at home. That you can own who you are in Christ and show up. I can talk this way because I'm a pastor. I can talk this way. So I can slap the thing around. I love the fact that we're waking up. I love the fact that cowardly churches are shutting down. I love the fact that bold churches are rising up. I love that people that are taking a stand are growing and multiplying. I love the fact that, that the weeds are being pulled. I love the fact that God is doing a work in his church. He is awake. I love the fact that he's awakening Darren's stock. I love the fact that he's drawing lines in the sand and saying, choose you this day who you will serve. I love the fact that I'm making a commitment. I know I ain't going to fix this thing. I, I love the fact I'm preparing my children to fix. I love the fact we're thinking multi-generational. I love the fact 
fact that we no longer believe that the rapture is the hope of the church. I love the fact that we believe that we are preparing the church for glory. We, I love the fact that we're preparing the church for the restoration of Eden. I love the fact that the new heavenly Jerusalem will come down and there will be a bride that is ready. I love the fact that we're finally allergic to religion. Well, they do a couple of verses and a couple of songs, and, and I feel a little better about myself, and I go out and I try to have my best week ever. Man, forget that. Forget that. You think God just created you so you can have your best you now? No. Stuff stinks. It's because of sin. It's because of Genesis chapter 3. But thank you, Father, for sending your son for commissioning a church to go into all the world with the great news of the gospel, that we can good news everything. We good news it, good news it, good news it until it transforms into the image and likeness of heaven. Yes. <laughs> Declare me right now, all you, all you parents, we teach, we teach. Our, children our children how to honor, how to honor. women. The origin of women. And we teach our children the narratives of the world. That means we prepare our children for the serpent. So that when the serpent comes with his serpent lies, our children say, we've been waiting for you. We don't focus completely on the devil. We focus on truth. But then we also train our children that we are in a war and there is an enemy. Yeah. This is the good news of our great God. And this is the narrative and philosophy and theology of Satan, the adversary. And we prepare our kids for war. If you're a parent, say, I will prepare my children for war. Come on. And if you are a woman here, and you know who you are. Declare this with me. In fact, every woman here, would you stand to your feet? And as they do, can we celebrate them one more time? Come on. Come on. Come on, guys. Let's go. Woo! All the ladies, why don't you declare with me right now? I embrace my call, my identity. I embrace this honor. Some of you, it's going to be hard to be honored. Some of you, it's going to be hard to even receive celebration because you think you're unworthy to be celebrated. But part of your transformation and part of you stepping into your destiny is you're going to have to learn to be celebrated. And you're going to have to learn to celebrate yourself. Some of you are married to men that don't know how to celebrate you. And some of you are going to have to teach your man how to celebrate you. Some of you are going to have to have a conversation with your man. Listen, I'm going to go out and have myself a spa day. You're paying for it. Thank you for celebrating me in this way. You're going to have to learn to receive celebration. You're going to have to learn to honor yourself because you are worthy of honor. You are worthy to be celebrated. Just declare, I am worthy of honor. I am worthy to receive celebration. And I receive, go and close your eyes, a revelation of my beauty. I will no longer hide behind masculine energy, behind a masculine personality. That doesn't make me strong. I choose to step into a fresh grace by faith Christ alone, I step into the fullness of my identity as a woman, as a life giver, 
as a mother of all living things. Just let that settle in. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Holy Spirit, just begin to restore all through this room. Just begin to restore all through this room. Declare a grace for restoration all through this room right now. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. I just declare in Jesus' name a fresh joy that accompanies the knowledge and revelation of what it means to be a mother, to be a woman. I declare a fresh peace right now in Jesus' name. I rebuke all anxiety that's been attached to your gender. I rebuke even the word curse spoken by some of y'all's father that said, I wish I would have had a boy. I rebuke any identity formation that was done outside of the perspective of your heavenly Father. And I declare a restoration of your true identity right now. And I pray that by God's grace, He would show you right now in the Spirit what you look like in the Spirit. So with your natural eyes shut and your spiritual eyes open, would you say, Jesus, would you show me how you see me. Thank you, Lord. Wow. Wow. Look at you. Isn't you gorgeous? Ain't you beautiful? The world is in need of this beauty. The world is in need of this grace. The world is in need of your story. Why would you try to hide that? We are transformed by the renewing of our minds. And we transform through encounter with Christ. I pray for a series of encounters for you that would confirm every word that we have spoken today. I ask for demonstrations of His Spirit I ask for conversations in the natural and for trances and heavenly visions even in the night hour. That there would be confirmation of the Word of God and that there would be complete transformation in and through your identity that you can step into the fullness of who God created you to be and you'll be celebrated by this church. You'll be celebrated by your family. We will celebrate you as you step into the fullness of your royal identity and all the people of God said, Amen. Come on, let's make some noise.